I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the Poisson random field model in population genetics. And so this is a tutorial talk. And the first bunch is going to be an overview of, uh, um, well, the Poisson random field model. And then I'll talk uh, in the second part about some applications of this model uh, to answer different biological questions. So um, I'm a population geneticist at uh, UCLA. And so we're very interested in studying the forces that change allele frequencies or change the frequencies of genetic variants in, in the genome. And so just to make sure we're all on the same page, I'm going to, in my talk today, be focusing a lot on natural selection. So there's two, well, several main flavors of, of selection. One is, is what's called positive selection, where there's a mutation that confers some sort of fitness advantage, and it increases in frequency if it's not lost by uh, something called genetic drift. We also have negative selection, which these are uh, the process where deleterious mutations or those mutations that confer a reduction in fitness, they may be uh, also related to uh, disease. Um, but where these mutations get pushed down in frequency uh, and potentially removed from the population. And so really this question of trying to estimate, you know, how much selection is there, what type of selection is there, that's really been one of the central challenges and problems in population genetics, you know, for, for decades. And I think this idea can be sort of boiled down into something called the distribution of fitness effects, or DFE. And all this is, is essentially a probability distribution of the selection coefficients uh, for different mutations. So imagine if we think about uh, protein coding genes and we think about exons, and you could have non-synonymous mutations occurring, so those mutations that change the encoded amino acids. And just imagine that for every mutation that occurs, you go into this distribution and you draw a selection coefficient, or you take one out. And the selection coefficient is, is the, that fitness effect of the mutation. And so a distribution of fitness effects maybe could look something like this, where you've got a, a lot of strongly deleterious mutations, as well as some neutral mutations that don't um, affect fitness, and, and you know, some in the middle, but maybe not quite as many. Or potentially a distribution of fitness effects could look something like this, where you have a lot of weakly deleterious mutations and fewer strongly deleterious mutations. Maybe there's also a component of beneficial mutations uh, in, in this distribution. And so a key question is, what does this distribution of fitness effects look like and in, in different species or for different uh, 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 annotations of, of the genome? And so, uh, why might we be interested in studying the fitness effects of mutations? Well, a lot of questions in evolutionary biology uh, relate either directly or indirectly to this distribution of fitness effects. So for example, if we're interested in uh, understanding just how much genetic variation there is in different species, um, and, and is, does that relate to neutral processes like, like genetic drift or population size or migration? Well, we need to have some sense of the distribution of, of fitness effects to um, be able to, to address that. Um, on a more applied level, um, something that's become uh, relevant in, in more recent times is thinking about the genetic load of populations, or that is the burden or amount of uh, deleterious variation carried in certain populations. That's become relevant in uh, conservation genetics for determining, or for perhaps, guiding management strategies for small populations about which individuals to essentially like translocate to uh, bring in. Um, how one might go about doing that depends in part on um, patterns of uh, deleterious variation. Now, even if we don't care about evolution, um, there's also uh, very uh, important questions in medical genetics uh, uh, that pertain uh, and relate to the dis distribution of fitness effects. So for example, the relative roles of rare versus common variants in uh, determining complex traits, whether we might expect to see more heritability coming from rare variants or common variants in part depends on this distribution of fitness effects. And so if we have 
uh, uh, knowledge of this distribution of fitness effects, and that tells us something about architecture of traits, that could then tell us a bit about how we might go about associating variants with traits. You know, should we be doing GWAS and bigger and bigger samples, or should we really be focusing on rare variants and sequencing? These evolutionary models have some bearing on, on that question. Okay, so central question is, can we infer fitness effects of mutations from genetic variation data? So data from natural populations, and how might we be able to do that? So that's the focus of, of my talk. And as I mentioned, my talk will be uh, broken into three major parts. The first is introducing this uh, model in population genetics, the Poisson random field model. And then uh, for the second and third parts, I'll talk about how this model, uh, how we've used it to try to answer some questions pertaining to the distribution of fitness effects and inference of dominance. Okay, so Poisson random field model. So let's maybe start by thinking about the kind of data that we might have uh, for studying fitness effects. So imagine, and we don't actually have to imagine because this is actually happening in, in even far greater uh, sample size than, than what's shown here. But anyway, we sequence a number of individuals. Uh, and so let's say here we have five, essentially five haplotypes or sequences from five haploid individuals. And this is just showing the variable positions where, where there's SNPs in the data. Um, it, this doesn't have to be uh, phased. So it could be these, you know, uh, uh, basically two rows could make up an individual. Um, and so what we can do is in this se uh, multiple sequence alignment of individuals from the population, we can simply look at these variable sites and let's say we know that the ancestral state, that is the old, older state, um, was, was the A nucleotide, and we observe many individuals have the A. However, there's one that has the G nucleotide. So this G is the derived allele, or mutant allele, and it's at count one out of five. How we determine ancestral and derived state is a, essentially a whole sort of separate talk. Um, it can be used from comparative genomic data. Um, turns out for most of what I'm talking about today, we can actually um, essentially fold the frequency spectrum or just look at the minor allele uh, and, and without worrying about this polarization. So anyway, moving on to the second uh, variable position here, you can see the uh, derived allele is at count two out of five. So we have this, whoops, this one and this one uh, carry it. The third one, the derived alleles at count one out of five, fourth site one out of five, and so on and so forth. So we tabulate the frequencies for each SNP, and then we create this histogram that essentially counts up the number of SNPs that are at different frequencies in the sample. So for example, in, in this case here, there are five uh, variants or five SNPs where the derived allele is at frequency one out of five. And those five are shown by the blue boxes here. You can count them up, there are five of them. There's two variants where the derived allele is at frequency two out of five, this one and this one, two where it's at three out of five, and none where the derived allele is at frequency four out of five. So why might we use this kind of uh, way of representing the data? Well, it turns out that this statistic is very sensitive to different evolutionary forces. And if the variants are unlinked, it actually is a sufficient statistic for the, uh, for the underlying sequence data. However, if variants are linked, we're losing that correlation structure uh, among them. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. So just for some notation here, if we have X just be the number of, of copies, or excuse me, the number of allele, or number of uh, sites that have the, this particular allele frequency. So X1 will be the number of singletons in the sample, X2 the number of doubletons, and so on and so forth. And we can then represent this uh, site frequency spectrum just as this vector x. Okay, so how do we use this to actually, or how can we do inference with this? So the basic idea is if we could compute what this frequency spectrum would be expected to be under different evolutionary models or different parameters. And we can denote that as the expected uh, site frequency spectrum or the ex expectation of x. We can then compute the site frequency spectrum from data, like I just showed, and compute the observed site frequency spectrum. Um, 
And then we can basically compare the observed and expected site frequency spectra, search the space of model parameters, and then find the parameters that give uh, the expected site frequency spectrum that's closest to the observed one, well, those are, can be our, our parameter estimates. And typically, this is done in a maximum likelihood framework. I'll talk a bit more about that in, in a second. But this is kind of the, the uh, 30,000 foot gist of how this all works. And you can probably immediately see that for, to do this, we need to be able to calculate the expected frequency spectrum from different evolutionary models for, for this to work. The data part is, is relatively straightforward. Okay, so how can we compute this uh, uh, expected frequency spectrum from population genetic models? So there's a number of ways you could uh, do this. One is, is um, you know, coalescent simulations. We, we like the coalescent. It's a stochastic model of evolution back in time. Um, there's some uh, programs out there that, that do, that implement it, or some software. So like MS uh, was, was one of the earlier implementations that was, was really, really excellent. MS Prime can simulate larger sequences. And then there's this other uh, program, FastSimCol, also a coalescent simulator. And it actually has built-in functionality to do this, to infer population size changes based on the frequency spectrum. So it's fast and you can get the frequency spectrum. However, it's really hard to model selection in, in this framework, especially uh, negative selection. So for the purposes of del studying deleterious mutations, as I've set out, this uh, framework is really not going to be, to be uh, useful to us. Another approach is forward in time simulations, where you basically start with a, a population, and each generation you have your different evolutionary forces occur, like mutation, recombination, uh, selection, drift. Um, this is implement, where it's implemented in several programs, but one of the more uh, popular and more versatile programs is this uh, uh, program called SLIM. Um, Advantages, you know, this is really, really flexible and can include a lot of biological complexity, including, you know, some, some uh, different age structured populations, uh, other ecological processes can all be added to the model. So that's, you know, really nice, but it's really, really slow and computationally intensive. Um, and even up until recently, this wasn't, you know, feasible. So, a uh, third approach, which is what we're going to do today, is uh, using some approximations to uh, the Wright Fisher model um, as implemented in some different software packages, uh, DADDY and FitDADDY. Um, DADDY stands for, uh, uh, what is it, Diffusion Approximation for Demographic Inference, and then FitDADDY is basically uh, a knockoff of DADDY, uh, but for inferring fitness effects. So. Um, this uh, Fit Daddy was, was uh, developed uh, in, in my group, um, and, and Daddy was developed uh, by Ryan Gutenkunst, uh, now at the University of Arizona. So advantages here, we can model selection pretty well in this framework, relatively fast, usually accurate. Uh, cons, there are some limitations to some of the uh, models that I'll, I'll, I'll uh, talk about here. But anyway, this is going to be the approach that we're going to use when thinking about the Poisson random field model. Um, and so a bit of uh, history on, on where this uh, model uh, first, first came about was really this paper in, in uh, genetics uh, in 1992 from Sawyer and, and Hartle was what started you know, using the term Poisson random field model. Um, and it essentially pulled in some you know, previously developed ideas in stochastic processes and population genetics but they actually tried relating it to molecular data here. And, and so that's where it sort of uh, got, got started. And initially they were like everybody uh, in population genetics in the early 1990s, they were trying to interpret patterns of uh, variation in the uh, alcohol dehydrogenase gene in Drosophila. Um, and so they, that's basically the data they were applying this to. And then a couple of years later, they extended the model from th thinking about polymorphism and, and divergence to model the whole frequency spectrum. Uh, and that's some of, some of those ideas are what we'll be uh, talking about um, today. So before we dive into what this uh, Poisson random field model is approximating and trying to model, 
I need to give a quick necessary detour for those of you who maybe aren't uh, used to thinking about population genetic models uh, sort of uh, right off the bat. And uh, this is a, a Wright Fisher model of, of genetic drift. So this is really a fundamental model in, in population genetics and in what I'm talking about. And just to sort of make sure we're all on the same page about what's happening in this model, imagine that, so this is a model of essentially reproduction uh, in an idealized population, but basically adults in one generation produce gametes that are joined at random to form kids for the next generation. And if we say K, so K is a count here, K out of 2N adult chromosomes have allele A. So then we can say Q is just going to be the frequency or the proportion of, of alleles that are type big A. Um, and then what we'll do is just sample from one generation to the next two big N chromosomes from the previous generation to form the next generation. And um, we'll do that with replacement. So it's possible that some gametes or some uh, chromosomes don't get sampled and others get sampled multiple times. Uh, yeah. And that this is that part where the sampling with replacement comes from. So given this model, right, this, this, the frequency or the, the count of, of the big A allele will be binomial, binomially distributed. Um, and so this, right, is a, a Markov chain, uh, uh, essentially, of, of the allele frequency over time with the transition probability coming from this binomial dis distribution. So this is essentially like the exact model. Um, and you could go through and you know, simulate from this discrete time model, but it would be pretty clunky and slow. Um, it's also you know, next to, I won't say impossible, but hard, challenging to do anything uh, uh, serious for, for you know, realistically sized populations using this uh, uh, directly. And so, right, this is just if we uh, plot it out, this is how it might look, where each plot shows a different realization of an allele that started at frequency 50% and what happens with it over, over time. Um, you can see these all kind of look a bit different, and that's kind of the, the point here, that this is a random process because some individuals by chance do not leave any kids, others have you know, more than one kid. And so that can mean that, or that uh, implies that these alleles can change in frequency just by random sampling. Now, you could also include natural selection in, in this model in a deterministic way that would just essentially add an extra layer uh, onto changing this allele frequency Q um, deterministically, like either kicking it up or down a little bit to account for selection. Okay, so now, that's, that's the uh, quick detour. So what does the Poisson random field model actually do? So there's essentially two major uh, approximations that, that are, uh, well, a couple approximations and then some extra complexity. Um, and so basically we start taking that Wright Fisher model with the binomial sampling, but instead of considering only one mutation at a time, we're going to consider many mutations. So that's one thing we're going to do. And then we're also going to approximate this binomial uh, 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 probability with a continuous uh, stochastic process. So to sort of explain how, how this works, imagine and we have a you know, genome with, let's say, L bases uh, that we're interested in. And this could be the whole genome, or it could be just the non-synonymous sites, or it could be you know, non-coding sites in a uh, particular uh, Chrome HMM annotation, but there's some basic set of sites. And each generation in this model, some number of mutations will occur. The number of mutations that occur will be Poisson distributed with a uh, rate parameter equal to, so 2n, right, that's the number of chromosomes in our population. And then each uh, chromosome could have basically mu, that's the per base pair mutation rate, and then L is the number of bases that you know, could mutate. And so in this hypothetical example here, we have three mutations essentially occur. So we have this Poisson number of mutations entering the population. And then after that, each one of these mutations follows its own Wright-Fisher uh, process of drift and selection, if you want to include it in. So 
And then each generation, while you have these mutations changing in frequency, you can have other mutations uh, occurring at you know, different sites in, in this genome. And then at the end of this, we can say, okay, what are the present day frequencies? And then combine them all back together to make a, a frequency spectrum. So that's the overview of sort of what, what happens in, in the model. And so the, the key thing from this uh, Sawyer and Hartle paper was, so the, the um, diffusion approximations I'll, I'll talk about in a second, uh, for, for approximating drift, that was established previously. Their big advance was to uh, basically apply what could happen for one uh, mutation to a whole set of mutations and making these uh, uh, assumptions about there being this Poisson number of mutations that uh, can, can occur. So I drew this as you know, the mutations occurring on, on one like, like haplotype, but it turns out these are assumed to be unlinked from each other, right? Each, each mutation has its own right fissure um, process. And so we're assuming that they're unlinked from one another. And so while a sequence maybe can have L sites, there's no spatial information that's being used here. We're assuming all the mutations are independent and identically um, distributed. This can be both a strength and weakness you know, of, of the model. So on the one hand, we're not using any information about linkage. Um, and, and we're ignoring that for this, this mathematical um, convenience of modeling things independently of each other. Um, but that can impose some complications to the uh, interpretation and assessing statistical significance of, of parameter or, or of, of hypothesis tests that I'll, uh, if I have time, mention a bit later. Um, and these L sites, yeah, can come from different sequence annotations, you know, synonymous, non-synonymous, DHS sites, whatever uh, you want to use. So this is just a sort of a more colorful picture of how this could work. Um, this is showing for neutral mutations, and these might be deleterious mutations, just sort of how they each uh, what happens over time, you know, this is not at one base in the genome, this is over a whole bunch of, of sites, and you can see the mutations uh, in the deleterious case, they're generally pushed lower in frequency than the neutral case, but with, with some, you know, exceptions. Uh, and this is kind of stuff I just said. Okay, so to actually use this, what do we need? Well, we need probabilistic model of selection and drift. Um, and so the right fisher model that I've outlined is, is essentially how we're going to do that. But we probably need a faster way to approximate this right fisher model. And for that, we'll, we would need diffusion theory. And then the other thing that we'll need is, is a way to do inference uh, with this. So a, basically a, a likelihood function to uh, think about for, for the SFS. So I'll talk about uh, that uh, in, in a moment. So the way to think about how we can approximate this binomial uh, model of drift in, in, a, in a continuous approximation is we're basically taking two things that used to be discrete. We have, right, the allele frequencies in the original model. It's a count, an integer, but we're going to make that continuous here. So Q is our allele frequency, and we're going to think about making that continuous between 0 and 1. And we're also going to treat time as a continuous uh, 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 on its continuous scale rather than discrete over generations. So if, for example, here we start at some fre allele frequency P and we're interested in going to the frequency Q plus uh, delta Q here, so that's like the front part and the end part, so we're interested in the probability of going from P to frequency Q plus delta Q in this whole time interval, which is time T plus delta T. So if that's what we're interested in computing, then that can be basically broken down into the probability of going from P to Q in time interval T, so that's this part here, and then going from Q to Q plus delta in time delta T. That's this part here. But of course, there's a lot of you know, trajectories an allele could take uh, yeah, uh, you know, to get from here to here, and that's what's you know, shown by all of these. So we would need to integrate over all of these possible values of Q. 
So this is essentially like the uh, chapman kolmogorov uh, equations from stochastic uh, processes. And we can use that here to model this allele frequency change in the population. Now, one can essentially do a, a Taylor expansion uh, on, on that to come up with the forward equation and the, the backward one. So uh, Kimura did a lot of this work in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, and basically, if so what we can get is this differential equation here. And sort of some key, key things here is that in here we have uh, this, this uh, B function. It you know, turns out you have the frequency times 1 minus the frequency divided by 2n. This looks an awful lot like a binomial uh, variance, right? Or, or for binomial variance for the proportion, uh, or in this case what I'm calling Q. And this is essentially what's modeling the, the genetic drift or the, the random component. And then over here, this S is our selection coefficient or our fitness effect. And so this part here includes the deterministic forces related to um, selection. So you can't really use this you know, directly uh, to, to um, uh, compute things. However, um, there's some useful solutions that have been derived analytically under some simple models relating to a constant population size of like n individuals. And so, for example, here, if, every, if all the uh, SNPs are neutral, so no natural selection, then the pr probability, or the density, I should say, of, uh, uh, of allele frequency for Q is just going to be 2 over Q. So that's for the, the neutral model. Um, if, in, if there's natural selection, well, the formula is a bit more complicated here, but where we have this uh, 2ns uh, uh, term in here. And these come from basically the amount of time that the uh, mutations will have uh, certain frequencies in the population, and so that then can be turned into the density of mutations at that uh, frequency. So this is just telling us about allele frequencies in the population. Remember, we want to be thinking about the properties of, of a sample, right? And so if we want to compute the expected number of, say, SNPs at frequency i, well, how do we do that? We can think about, basically, this is the, like, for example, the number of, of singletons. Well, that's going to be equal to um, uh, theta over 2, right? That's the number of mutations entering the population. And then this is the probability of a mutation having count i in our sample, given that it has frequency q in the population, times, and then we multiply that by the this uh, frequency density, and again integrate over all the values of q to basically get the probability of count i. So it turns out, right, that if we're thinking about going from the uh, Population frequency Q to the sample count I, right, that's just simply binomial uh, sampling given the value of Q. And so that, this can actually link the, what's happening in the population and what we get from the diffusion equation, equations to uh, what we expect to see in the sample. And so if we um, basically apply those equations for the neutral frequency spectrum. This is what, what we would uh, see here. And this is you know, just an example, sample size 10 with a population scaled mutation rate theta of, of 1,000. And lo and behold, there's 1,000 singletons in our sample, uh, 500 doubletons, uh, what, 333 tripletons, and so on and so forth. And this recapitulates this nice uh, theoretical result that you know, can be derived in other ways in terms of the numbers of uh, mutations at different frequencies in, in our sample. So this is the neutral one. What if we instead replace the, uh, so this was, sorry, the neutral one was using for f of q using basically this for the density of the population frequency. Now if we turn to this case with selection, we can use this down here. Uh, and for different values of 2ns, you can see we get this frequency spectrum. So for values of 2ns that are you know, pretty, pretty small, well, 
It's almost like the neutral frequency spectrum, but then as 2NS starts to become more, more negative, then you start to see there's this reduction in the number of SNPs across the frequency spectrum. And then if we consider much more deleterious or mutations that have stronger values of 2NS, so this gamma is 2NS. Uh, and if we think, uh, look at negative 10, what you can see here, right, this yellow curve, there's virtually all of the SNPs that are there are at frequency, or at counts in the sample of one, two, or three, and virtually none of them are at five through, through nine. So there's this big reduction in, in the number of SNPs that's in the data, but those that are there tend to be really rare. And so that's exactly what we expect to see with negative selection, removing them from, from the population. So, this, uh, we can sort of see this uh, and, and find this uh, pretty directly analytically from the uh, equations that I've uh, mentioned. Um, okay, so the last part of this is, okay, what if we want to do inference here on, on a particular data set? I mentioned we need some kind of likelihood formulation. And so one of the, uh, yeah, so sure. It's continuous space on the allele frequencies as well as on the time steps. Yeah. So it's mostly a continuous approximation. Yes. So there's no additional assumptions about independence that you make other than the independence on between SNPs. That's that's right. That's right. And this approximation, you know, will be you know, for rarer alleles, you know, maybe not as good as when they get to be more common in the population. And if, I mean, so we're, it's the approximations better as the population size gets bigger and, and S gets smaller. Um, yeah. Other questions? All right. So, um, it turns out in, in this uh, model here, right, that one of the nice properties is, is by having this, uh, modeling the mutations as a Poisson process that, that come in here, then we can think about that the data is actually the probabilistic model of the data we can follow this uh, Poisson distribution. Um, and so what that means is these expected counts from the model will actually become our rate parameter in, in the Poisson distribution. And so thus the probability of seeing, for example, xi SNPs uh, being at count i, well, that's just going to be a, a familiar Poisson probability with the lambda being, or the rate parameter in the Poisson distribution being basically this uh, thing here. And the xi's, right, are the observed numbers of SNPs at count i in, in our sample. And then we can use this uh, following, uh, basically, calculate this for each bin of the frequency spectrum. So going from 1 to n minus 1 and um, you know, take the, the product over all of the, the bins of, of the frequency spectrum. And so that can then you know, provide us with a, with a likelihood function. So this was sort of the very idealized model in practice, right? We might have populations that are um, not constant size. And so for example, maybe they're expanding or contracting. And so the equations that the analytical solutions that, that we had for the uh, probability of, or for, for the population frequency distribution, those won't apply directly. And so there's been a, a several uh, uh, papers that have come up with different numerical solutions uh, for the uh, diffusion equations uh, directly under different um, population size change models. And so basically you can numerically um, uh, solve the uh, equations to come up with the uh, frequency density. And that's what's uh, done in the DADI um, package. Okay, so that's kind of the, the nuts and bolts of the um, uh, PRF models. And um, next I'll talk about a way that we can apply this to actually uh, to, a, to a real system with some complications and show sort of how it works. So what we want to do is apply this uh, framework for uh, inferring this actually the distribution of fitness effects. Um, and so we're, we can assume that, or at least for the uh, to start, we'll assume that the, uh, this distribution of uh, uh, selection coefficients can follow, follows a gamma distribution. 
And then our goal is to estimate the shape and scale parameters. So we can take the sort of model we've been talking about, but with some additional complications. Um, and actually, let me, sorry, let me jump to here. Okay, so, and then I'll go back. So I mentioned real populations like humans and Drosophila, they don't have constant population size. Uh, and so how do we actually, I mentioned the sort of mathematical part of, of um, doing numerical solutions, but how do we actually uh, infer the demographic history of the population? So what we uh, did here and, and what's typically done is we can take, if we're interested in inferring selection on the non-synonymous mutations, that is like say the amino acid changing mutations, if we have a class of sites that are putatively neutrally evolving, um, that are uh, physically interdigitated in the sequence with the ones we're interested in, uh, in inferring selection on, then we can use those sites or the synonymous SNPs to infer demographic models. So like a population size change model, for example, and then conditional on those demographic parameter estimates infer selection. So for example, here, this uh, top here is the frequency spectrum from, from humans, uh, oops, uh, blue, or excuse, yeah, from, from humans, the dark blue is the observed site frequency spectrum for synonymous sites. And then when we fit a growth model, uh, that's what's shown with the uh, lighter blue. And then we did the same thing in, in Drosophila. Obviously the models are very different, but the framework and approach is, is similar. So we essentially use the putatively neutral sites to inf uh, infer this uh, size change. That's the, how we deal with the non-equilibrium demography. Okay, so now I can go back here. Okay, so what we want to do then is find, right, the uh, calculate the expected number of SNPs at uh, count i in, in our, our sample. Given this theta d, that's our demographic parameters, and given our distribution of fitness effects. That's what we want to uh, infer here. So this is the same approach as what we, you know, had before and what I, what I uh, talked about. Um, except we have a couple complications here. So one is, is rather than a single value of gamma or a single value of 2ns, um, we're going to have a distribution of, of 2ns, and, and that can be like our gamma distribution that has these uh, parameters here, um, theta DFE, whoop, I think I have an extra gamma in there, so that shouldn't be there. Um, but this is our gamma distribution. This is what we talked about already, the uh, probability of the allele frequency, Q, but given both selection and the demographic model that we're uh, considering. Uh, and then we have our you know, binomial sampling. Okay, and then our likelihood function you know, is, is going to be, again, similar to what I've already uh, talked about before, it's this Poisson -like, uh, likelihood function, and we get the expected uh, uh, SFS, site frequency spectrum, from the model of uh, our demographic parameters and our, our, our demographic parameters and our distribution of uh, fitness effects. Um, I'm telling you about the gamma distribution, but we could assume that the selection coefficients come from some other distribution. We've tried you know, some different ones. Uh, the gist of how this works is, is the same. Okay, and so our result was when we apply this approach to uh, humans and, and Drosophila, for example, for humans, we fit a gamma distribution to the non-synonymous mutations with this uh, shape and scale parameter and, and this uh, log likelihood associated with it. And this shows the, uh, the, you know, what that actual DFE looks like in blue for humans. We do the same thing for flies, and that gives us the red histogram, and you notice that in flies, there's fewer, we infer fewer strongly deleterious mutations compared to humans. We then, uh, and this, oh, these plots here show the uh, likelihood surfaces uh, for, of the parameter estimates. Um, we can then also look at a restricted model where we assume that the 
uh, shape and scale parameters are the same between the two species. And if we do that, that gives the log likelihood uh, down here. And you can see that, in fact, the, um, the more complex model where each species has their own parameters is a much better fit, has a much lower log like or much higher log likelihood than the uh, model that assumes the parameters are the same between species. And so that suggests that there's different distributions of fitness effects uh, between the species. Uh, this, you know, the gamma distribution fits, uh, you know, the SFS visually reasonably well. Um, of course, I'm not, I don't have time to go into all the details of the ways that we've tested this with simulations, but um, just to sort of highlight a couple uh, key things here, right? I mentioned this, uh, uh, that in the PRF model, we assume that there's, the sites are unlinked, but obviously in the real data, there's linkage. So what one can do is simulate data with linkage and then apply this method to it and look at, well, how do the estimates behave? And perhaps more importantly, how does this distribution of the likelihood ratio test statistics behave uh, un under the, the null? Um, and so what did we do here? So this was a case where we had different DFEs in Drosophila and humans. Um, and in fact, you can see that the, the points are clustered on the true values, so that's good. Panel B, we were assuming that both species have the same distribution of fitness effects. So here we're simulating under the null, basically, uh, where the DFE is the same, uh, but the species have their different demographies. Uh, and you can see that we recover the null uh, nice, quite well. And then what we're, I'm showing you here is basically that distribution of the likelihood ratio test statistic as compared to a chi-square distribution. And you can in fact see that the linkage does actually uh, confound a little bit the, uh, or not confound, but um, uh, causes the actual empirical distribution to not perfectly follow the chi-square distribute, the asymptotic chi-square distribution. Uh, and the tail, in fact, is a bit fatter. But none of the, uh, of these simulated likelihood ratio tests were uh, uh, greater than 34 under, under the null, and our observed one was much, much bigger. Uh, we've done other simulations, testing this independence assumption. Uh, in, in different demographic models. And basically the punchline is that for the models we've uh, considered so far, which by no means is an exhaustive set, um, the uh, demographic models seem to be correcting for the effects of, of linkage and we can still get unbiased estimates of the DFE. Um, let's see, so maybe we jump to uh, just to wrap up, we can apply this also to infer dominance coefficients for, for mutations. Um, and that's something that we've done uh, by basically adding an extra parameter to, to this. Uh, and another key thing that we did here was leverage, so we apply this for, to Arabidopsis data where we can compare uh, self-fertilizing versus outcrossing species and that gives, allows us to disentangle the selection effect from the uh, dominance effect. And um, basically what we do here is treat the species as independent from each other. We have a likelihood function for the inbred species and for the outcrosser. We assume the DFE and dominance models are the same but allow each species to have its own demographic models. And let's jump ahead here. Um, in fact, what we find is, maybe here's the final result, that basically the more deleterious mutations are, they tend to be more recessive. And the more weakly deleterious mutations tend to be uh, a bit more additive. And so that's suggesting, in fact, that there's um, some recessive mutations in, in the data um, and they tend to be more deleterious. Okay, and lastly, um, you know, obviously that work was in Arabidopsis, so there's a question of, well, what about, uh, you know, for humans? Uh, maybe we don't have the power to separately infer selection and dominance, but, you know, do these models fit? Uh, the Arabidopsis model, for example, fit uh, 
uh, in, in humans. And so this is ongoing uh, work uh, led by a former postdoc in, in the lab. And what we did basically was just test, well, how maybe we don't have a, the ability to separately infer an SNH, but we can take um, different models and see how well they compare to, say, the simple additive model uh, in, in the 1,000 genomes data. And so to start out with, you know, this is the additive model uh, and the distribution of fitness effects that one sees for non-synonymous mutations. This is the model we inferred from Arabidopsis that essentially is quite recessive uh, for the selection coefficients. And that model does not fit, or, or this HS relationship does not fit as well uh, to the human data. Um, and so that's, you know, that's uh, interesting, suggesting that there could be some differences between species. But then we wanted to ask, okay, well, there's obviously a big space between this recessive model uh, from the Arabidopsis and a, you know, everything's additive model. And so searching over this space, basically, uh, there are other models where strongly deleterious mutations tend to be recessive that actually fit the data nearly as well as the truly additive model and they have similar uh, DFEs. So work is ongoing uh, in, in this area to uh, basically see what kind, how recessive can mutations be to still be compatible with uh, human uh, data. So in sum, uh, the Poisson random field model provides a way to efficiently model negative selection and estimate parameters from data. Um, it's been around, this framework's been around for a really long time and has been extended to include things like non-equilibrium demography, distributions of fitness effects dominance, as well as um, multiple populations. I, I didn't talk about that here. Um, we found uh, interesting results suggesting that distributions of fitness effects differ across species. Of course, there's you know, more data becoming available and more pairs and combinations of species we could look at. And you know, we're finding that inferring dominance is, is also uh, possible and many deleterious mutations are partially recessive uh, and the more strongly deleterious ones tend to be more recessive. Um, but more work's needed to see how general this, this is across uh, different species. And so I'd like to thank the uh, former people in my lab that did uh, a lot of this uh, work, and thanks for listening.